The Ottoman Empire's failure to capture Vienna in 1683 was a turning point, marking not just the end of Ottoman expansion into Europe, but signalling the start of the empire's slow decline. By the 19th century, a new world order was emerging that would leave the Ottoman Empire struggling for its very existence. Vienna may have dashed Ottoman hopes of further expansion into Europe, but it perfectly coincided with the emergence of a new threat on Europe's eastern horizons, Russia. For the next two centuries, these two imperial powers would be locked in a deadly embrace, the fallout from which would have profound consequences for the destiny of Europe. Founded in 1703, St. Petersburg expresses perfectly Russia's early imperial ambitions. The city was the creation of one of the country's most celebrated Tsars, Peter the Great, who wanted to build a new Russian capital to rival those of the great European powers. Peter the Great is still hugely revered in St. Petersburg, and every day at noon, a cannon salute is fired off in his honor. I believe it's a very big bang. Peter the Great was a modernizer, a reformer, which in Russia in the early 18th century meant a westernizer. So his model of reform was to import everything he thought useful for Russia in terms of technology. He dictated to his nobles that they should shave their beards and bring women into society, build their palaces in a certain way for his new capital in St. Petersburg. In 1721, just four years before his death, Peter the Great was proclaimed Emperor of all the Russias. It was a bold statement, and it announced his intention to turn Russia into a major European superpower, an agenda that was subsequently followed by all the czars that came after him. But this was an ambition that was not so easily realized. Russian expansion brought them into direct confrontation with the Ottoman Empire and the Ottomans were not about to relinquish their own imperial dreams without a fight. If Russia was to become a great power, it would need a strong navy, and that required access to warm water ports. This drove Russian expansion southwards towards the Black Sea. Throughout the 18th century, Russian forces confronted the Ottomans repeatedly, they pushed into Ottoman territory on the northern coast of the Black Sea and the Caucasus and occupied the Ottoman vassal states of Moldova and Wallachia. Russia needed to expand southwards in the 18th century because it saw that its economy needed to diversify and that depended on the development of ports on the Black Sea to open up Russia's trading routes through the Dardanelles into the Mediterranean. But Russian expansion was not limited to Ottoman domains. Poland and Lithuania were absorbed into the empire as well, raising tensions with Western Europe. But it was Russia's role in bringing Napoleon's armies to their knees that secured its position as a new superpower. By the 19th century, Russia had become the fastest growing empire in Europe and a major force to be reckoned with. Russia's defeat of Napoleon was accompanied by a burgeoning sense of nationhood, of imperial pride. This column behind me, standing in the middle of St. Petersburg's main square, was erected as a celebration of that triumph. But as one empire rises, so another slips into decline. And by this time, the Ottoman Empire was so diminished that it would soon come to be known as the sick man of Europe.
From its territorial height at the end of the 17th century, the Ottoman Empire slowly contracted, losing Croatia, parts of Romania, and all of Hungary to Austria. The Ottoman Empire in the early 19th century was seen throughout Europe as an empire in decline. It had large Christian minorities that were increasingly becoming conscious of the need for religious liberation from the Ottoman Empire. There were lots of armed bands going about the place. There were local warlords setting themselves up as <clears throat> dictators in various areas, in, in the Balkans in particular. Rebellions flared up across Ottoman lands, in the Balkans, Wallachia, and Moldova. And a Greek independence movement was gaining momentum. In the 1820s, the Greek communities of the Ottoman Empire were beginning to rise up against Muslim rule. And they were encouraged by philo-Hellenic sympathies of Western intellectuals such as Byron, and in particular by the support of officials in St. Petersburg. Central to the empire's problems were the army's elite corps, the Janissaries, who had become corrupt and resistant to change. The army really needed modernization, but it meant pushing back the influence of this caste of Ottoman military leaders, the Janissaries, who had inherited their positions, who passed them on to their sons, and who were really fiefdoms within the army. The famous Janissary Corps, these were the, originally had been a sort of Praetorian guard around the Sultan, they had become a very disruptive, power-hungry element, jealous of their own privileges. They rose in rebellion in 1826 and were suppressed, but remained an element within the army that was going to oppose any modernization even after 1826. So that was the sort of problem facing Ottoman military leaders. The Sultan of the time realizes that he has to do something about this. There has to be reform. So he dumped them into the Bosphorus with cannonballs tied to their feet. Hundreds of them, thousands of them. The Janissaries, once famed for their discipline and loyalty to the Sultan, had come to a tragic end. But when it came to the rebellions raging across the empire, the new Ottoman army was no better at keeping order. Stories of brutal massacres stoked old resentments and divisions. And in the case of Russia, provided a pretext for invasion. Like so many times before, the Danube River became the front line of Ottoman defense. In 1828, the Russian army once again invaded the Romanian province of Wallachia, just over there. But they weren't content to stay put this time. They crossed over the Danube into Bulgaria there. Now, Bulgaria had been part of the Ottoman Empire for centuries. And suddenly, here was the Russian army in the Ottoman heartlands. In spring the following year, Russian forces swept southward, capturing the city of Edirne, just 200 kilometers west of Istanbul. As Russian battleships closed in on the Ottoman capital, the Sultan had no option but to sue for peace. As a result, Greece was given autonomy that would lead to independence, and the Dardanelles Straits were open to Russian shipping. For rebels across the Balkans, it was a rallying cry. For the powers of Western Europe, a distressing turn of events. But for Russia, the Ottoman Empire's near collapse had a more profound significance. By the 19th century, the Russian Empire had religion at its heart. More Russian Orthodox pilgrims visited Jerusalem than any other branch of the Christian Church. Since the fall of Constantinople, Russia saw itself as the natural heir to Byzantium and protector of all Orthodox Christians. Russian nationalists dreamed of conquering Istanbul and transforming it into Zagrad, a Russian capital for an Orthodox Christian empire stretching from Siberia to Jerusalem. 
Until that dream could be realised, Moscow would be the capital of the Orthodoxy and its new Jerusalem monastery, here just outside the city, a symbol of its intense faith and ambitions. The monastery of the New Jerusalem was an extraordinary project, an attempt to replicate the Holy Land in the heart of Mother Russia. And this was the very centerpiece of the church, the tomb of Christ, no less. And it's an incredible idea, really, as if by replicating the sacred architecture of the Holy Land could provide Russian Christians with a place of pilgrimage until such a time that Orthodox Christianity could reclaim Jerusalem for its own. It's a strange and rather dislocating experience. <laughs> The monastery was founded in 1656 by the Russian patriarch Nikon, who wanted its central church to be a faithful replica of the holiest Christian site in Jerusalem, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Vasily Martisevich is a spokesman for the monastery. In the 17th century, it was very difficult. And patriarch Nikon in the 17th century understood that constructing a copy вот э, этого э, храма гроба Господня, он воплотит э, те мечты э, русского человека, который мечтал попасть э, в это святое место, чтобы, э, поклонившись этим святыням, которые там есть, э, он мог как бы перенестись духом, э, увидеть, э, что все то же самое есть в Иерусалиме. Where we're standing right now, actually, inside the church, what, what are the specific features that we see around us? How do they relate to Jerusalem? Identical to the things that are in the Holy Grove of God. For example, the Kuvukli, Grove of God, the stone of Pemazan or the stone of Pavitia, have the same size. What does that tell us about the idea of Jerusalem and Christianity in relation to the, Russia as a country? Первый пал еще в пятом веке. Византийская империя берет на себя э, идею Второго Рима. И в пятнадцатом веке э, Византийская империя под ударами турок падает. И вот э, наступает то время, когда начинается искание Третьего Рима. Москва могла говорить о том, что она на себя может взять эту идею, то, что Москва – Третий Рим. К этому толкали многие публицисты того времени, многие писали, что э, два Рима пали, третья Москва стоит, а четвертому не бывать. То есть с этой идеей многие связывали постройку Нового Иерусалима. Russia's religious fervor gained added momentum when in 1825 Tsar Nicholas I became emperor of all the Russias. He was a devout Christian and champion of the Orthodox Church whose advancement he placed at the center of his foreign policy. Nicholas I was a man of order. He was a military man. He saw the Napoleonic Wars. To a certain extent, he was hostile to European powers because he saw the West as a source of infection for his Russian Empire. His own religious ideas were strongly messianic. There was a strong sense that Russia had to promote um, an idea of Russianness which was inseparable from the protection and promotion of orthodoxy right across the world. This went way back in Russian history to the idea of Moscow as the Third Rome. Tsar Nicholas visited New Jerusalem in 1818. And this was the same year that his son was born, and he saw this conjunction as a kind of divine providence. Now, Nicholas was a very religious man, there's no doubt about that, but he also suffered from mental illness and affliction of the Romana family. And sometimes it's hard to unravel the religious enthusiasm from imperial ambitions, from the delusions of a madman. This is what he had to say to King William of Prussia. I wage war not for worldly advantage or conquest, 
but solely for a Christian purpose? Am I to be left alone to fight under a holy banner and see others who call themselves Christians unite around the Crescent and to attack Christendom? There is nothing left for me but to fight, to win, or to perish with honor, a martyr to our holy faith. And when I say this, I declare it on behalf of all Russia. Tsar Nicholas's Christian zeal may have been genuine, but the Western powers weren't buying it. By the 19th century, a third of all Russian exports were passing through Black Sea ports. They feared Russian expansion was less about religion and more about empire. Eager to thwart Russian ambitions, Europe threw its weight behind Ottoman reforms hoping to shore up the empire and its ties with Western Europe while protecting its Christian populations. The result was a series of reforms known as the Tanzimat. What the Tanzimat reforms did, slowly over a long period, beginning in 1839, was to give more uh, religious rights, more autonomy to the Christian minorities, to make government in those areas a little more autonomous um, and accountable, and to reform administration along more Western lines. This then bleeds out into having an impact on how people live their lives on the streets. Um, so we start to get reforms in clothing that suddenly women and men are encouraged to wear Western style clothes. So the fez replaces the turban and a frock coat and a shirt with a collar replaces what was the kind of typical Ottoman gear and even Western shoes are worn on the streets. Um, women are allowed to be educated you have women who are allowed to be actresses and they, they perform on their stage. Uh, some of the Sultan's harem are taught to paint in the Western style and to play the piano. Ottoman reforms coincided with a sudden enthusiasm for all things Eastern in the West. The exotic and erotic allure of an Orientalist fantasy was romanticised in literature and art with the Ottoman court perceived as the ultimate realisation of a decadent world of opulence and indulgence. In the 18th and 19th centuries, certain elements of Western society become obsessed with the East. This is something that we now call Orientalism and at the time was sometimes called Ottomania. Men and women, particularly those with money and standing and influence, start to wear Ottoman-style clothes to parties. We even have this lovely little sketch of Jane Austen, who's wearing what's called a Mamluk cap. People start to commission paintings describing the Orient and the, and the East. So rather than being somewhere that was considered dark and dangerous, it becomes somewhere which is exciting and enticing. There is a sort of Western Orientalism, which softens Western perceptions of Islam and the Turk. I think it's partly to do with increased Western travel to the Holy Land, the Ottoman territories. The Islamic religion is sort of quiet, contemplative, peaceful. They luxuriate in this sense of liberation and that does change attitudes, I think, towards the Turk. It definitely has this erotic tinge to it. Uh, the idea of women in the harem shut up and they're only there to service a sultan and to bring him pleasure is something which men, to be honest, cannot get enough of. They love hearing harem stories. There are paintings of women in the harem. And the Western fascination and imagination is really fired. For the Ottomans, this was an incredibly mundane thing that women would do. They would go to get clean and to have a gossip, basically, and they'd come home. There was nothing erotic about it. The craze for all things Eastern reached new heights in the 19th century when English painter and sculptor, Lord Leighton, designed his sumptuous London residence. 
Lord Leighton was one of the real drivers who brought an Ottoman aesthetic into the British middle and upper classes. He was a passionate collector, he was a brilliant painter himself, and he really appreciated the beauty that he saw around him in North Africa, in Istanbul, in the Balkans, in the Middle East. And he started to bring back both the inspiration and the influence and actual things from that world. Here we have beautiful ceramic tiles that were made in the 17th century. There are inscriptions from the Quran. And the actual shape of this room is based on an Arab-influenced uh, hall from Sicily. So you can feel the Orient around you when you sit here. Tsar Nicholas, ensconced in his luxuriously appointed winter palace in St. Petersburg, seemed oblivious to European attitudes regarding the Turks. Assuming Western powers would always support a fellow Christian nation over a Muslim one, he decided to discuss the Ottoman problem with the British ambassador. This throne room was where the Tsars gave audience to foreign dignitaries, ambassadors, emissaries, that kind of thing. And it was in one such exchange between Tsar Nicholas I and the British ambassador that he famously declared, we have a sick man on our hands a man gravely ill. It would be a great misfortune if he were to slip through our hands, especially before the necessary arrangements had been made. Well, there was no mistaking who the sick man was, that was the Ottoman Empire. And that rather chilling phrase, before the necessary arrangements have been made. Nicholas believed that the Ottoman Empire was going to collapse and that it was therefore wise even legitimate for the Western powers to take measures so that the Ottoman territories were split between themselves in a way that would give Russia, if not direct control of the Balkans, then at least a dominant influence over those areas of the Balkans where the Orthodox were in a majority. As the sick man of Europe becomes sicker, everybody gathers around it with a keener intent to work out what their best interests are. Russia was poised to deliver the fatal blow, but the catalyst for action would not take place in Istanbul or the Balkans, but in the Ottoman-controlled holy city of Jerusalem. Built on what is believed to be the location of Jesus Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the city's most important Christian site and has long been a contested property between various branches of the Christian faith. The ceremony of the Holy Fire, held every Easter, is one of the Church's most spectacular events, but it has also been a flashpoint for conflict. In 1846, disputes between French Catholics and Orthodox Russians over privileges to the site became so embittered that an all-out riot erupted during the Easter celebrations. Pilgrims joined priests on both sides in a spree of violence. When the fighting was eventually quelled, more than 40 people lay dead on the floor. France had the idea that it was the main protectorate of the Christian community in the Holy Lands. An idea of France's mission going back to the Crusades of the Middle Ages. And they had secured from the Ottoman government, which ruled in Jerusalem, what they thought was a privileged access to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. But that was, for the Russians, negated by their own treaties with the Ottomans, which they thought gave the Orthodox privileged access to these very same places. You can imagine the position of the Ottomans. They prevaricated, saying yes to everybody in order to let the problem they hoped go away. But it didn't go away. To force the issue, Russian troops once again occupied the principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia and amassed forces on the Ottoman frontier in the Caucasus. 
For Tsar Nicholas, the situation was becoming intolerable. Determined to fulfill Russia's Christian duty, he issued an ultimatum. The Russians demanded a restoration of Orthodox privileges in Jerusalem and also that Russia be recognized as the protector of Orthodox Christians, not just in the Holy Lands, but throughout the Ottoman Empire. Well, obviously, this was going to greatly compromise Ottoman sovereignty. The Russian invasion of the Danube provinces had already compromised Ottoman territorial integrity. And so, Sultan Abdul Mesid felt compelled to declare war. Russia was a major power, but its army was obsolescent, unprofessional, and ill-equipped. Russia's navy, however, was another story. Since its founding by Peter the Great in the 17th century, it had developed into a formidable force. By the 19th century, it was turning the Black Sea into a Russian lake and threatening Western shipping by making repeated incursions into the Mediterranean. In the north, the island fortress of Kronstadt, here just outside of St. Petersburg, dominated the Gulf of Finland, protecting the city from invasion. Kronstadt continues to be an important naval base. Robert. Oh, Good how are you doing? How are you doing? Yeah, beautiful day, what? Yeah, it's just <laughs> welcome. Local historian, Roman Shaposhnik, is going to show me one of the Russian Navy's most impressive 19th century creations. Roman, this is a fantastic uh, landscape you brought me to. Sea, sky, and everywhere I look, fortifications. Tell me something about the history. Uh, uh, this battery uh, was built in times of Nicholas I. All these fortifications uh, are artificial islands. Uh, imagine how difficult it was to create. And this fort was armed by uh, 137 guns. Wow. In uh, uh, 1854, uh, uh, the English and French uh, naval uh, forces uh, came to the Gulf of Finland. And Admiral Nepir, the commander, said in the Telegraph newspaper that uh, his breakfast uh, will be in Kronstadt and his uh, dinner will be in St. Petersburg. <laughs> but when uh, he saw it first time, I think uh, he changed his plans a bit. Uh, understandably. So I imagine with all these fortifications, it's a very complex system of lines sure. of fire. And sure. In this period of time, Russia had very sophisticated and uh, very strong navy. And the Kronstadt fortress became the strongest naval fortress in Europe. The Russian Navy may have been largely defensive in the north, but here in the Black Sea, it was on the attack, prowling the waters in search of Ottoman warships and supply convoys heading for the Caucasus. Initially, they met with little success. In November 1853, Russian fortunes changed completely when they came across the Ottoman squadron, quite by chance, sheltering from a storm in the port of Sinop on the northern coastline of Anatolia. Completely unprepared for battle, the Ottoman vessels were sitting ducks. Russian guns bombarded the ships relentlessly. As the bombs ripped into the wooden planking, they exploded, tearing the ships apart and setting them alight. It was the first time explosive shells had been used in naval warfare. The effect was devastating. The Russian assault destroyed the entire Ottoman squadron and laid waste to the port, killing thousands of sailors and civilians. It was a great victory for Russia, but for Western Europe, a troubling turn of events. Britain and France realized they have to intervene because there is now nothing left to stop the Russians uh, getting hold of uh, the Bosphorus and potentially taking Constantinople. They have to enter the war at this point. In March 1854, Britain and France declared war on Russia. The Ottoman Empire, once the embodiment of evil, had become an ally. Like so many times before, the Danube River became the front line in the early stages of the war. 
Stretching from the Black Sea through the Balkans and into Central Europe, the Danube was a hugely strategic prize. Whoever controlled it gained a military and economic advantage. The Ottomans had fought hard to take it back in the 15th century, and they certainly weren't going to give it up without a fight. This stretch of the Danube is where, in 1853, Russian troops crossed to lay siege to the fortified Ottoman town of Silistra, just there. The idea was that once they'd taken Silistra, they would then march on Istanbul as they had done 25 years earlier. But, as so often in war, the best laid plans just don't happen that way. Russian forces positioned themselves on hilltops overlooking the city and began a relentless bombardment, day and night. It was, in effect, a shock and awe offensive, designed to topple the town quickly. To the casual observer, it was simply a fantastic spectacle. The young Leo Tolstoy, who was an officer in the Russian army, here at the time, provides us with a vivid picture of the scene in a letter that he wrote to his aunt. I amused myself, watch in hand, counting the cannon shots that I heard, and I counted 100 explosions in the space of a minute. The spectacle was truly beautiful, especially at night. What at first seemed like a spectator sport to Russian onlookers soon turned into a nightmare. The Ottomans had learned from the last Russian siege of Silistra and built a ring of sturdy fortifications around the city. The Russians found themselves held up in Silistra by Turkish forces that turned out to be much better than they'd expected. The Turks were good at um, fortifications, artillery. They were used to siege warfare against fortresses. As the siege dragged on, the death toll steadily rose, numbering thousands on both sides. And the war descended into a particularly grisly hand-to-hand -hand combat. Tsar Nicholas urged his commanders to put a speedy end to the siege. But the Ottoman resistance was ferocious. The Turks fight like devils, reported a captain in the Russian artillery. After one particularly bloody assault, there were 2,000 Russian dead lying on the field of battle. The very next day, the people of Silistra came out and cut off their heads, hoping for prize money. When this was refused, they simply bunged their grisly trophies outside the city walls, where they lay unburied for the longest time. The huge loss of Russian life, fears that Austria would join the campaign, and news that British and French troops had landed at the Black Sea port of Varna, little more than 100 kilometers away, compelled the Russian general to call an end to the siege and retreat back across the river. The Russian offensive had been a complete failure, and the war was just beginning. The Russian withdrawal from Silistra removed any immediate threat to the Ottoman Empire, and the war could have ended there and then. But the Sultan didn't want to let the Russians go that easily. And the French and the English, they'd come too far. They didn't want to go home without a fight. Moreover, they were keen to put an end to Russian influence in the Black Sea once and for all. So they re-embarked their soldiers on the troop carriers and set sail for the Crimean Peninsula with the intent of destroying the Russian naval base at Sebastopol. Unfortunately, what looked like an easy victory on paper turned out to be a disastrous military quagmire for all concerned. Waged almost entirely on the Crimean Peninsula, what became known as the Crimean War would drag on for two more years and enter history as one of the most disastrous military campaigns of its time. Famed for Florence Nightingale and the Charge of the Light Brigade, the Crimean War was plagued by incompetence and mismanagement. Thousands of soldiers on all sides met their death in battle, but many more died of disease or froze to death over the winter months. When Russia finally surrendered, 
the estimated loss of life had reached some 700,000. At least half a million of those were Russian. In Russia, the neglect of the troops, the poor supply, this was all blamed on Nicholas and the defeat for a war that many in Russia believed hadn't been necessary in the first place. It was a war fought for delusional goals. And so when Nicholas I dies in February 1855, he knew that it was his responsibility. This was a catastrophe for him because it was the collapse of his ideology, his worldview, his religious belief, his sense that he was on a divine mission. This failure was a, a personal catastrophe. The legacies of the Crimean War were equally profound. Russia's ambitions in that area would not go away. The pan-Slav movement was strengthened by the Crimean War. The sense of Russia's mission in the Balkans also strengthened. In the ethnic-religious fault line between Christian and Muslim Europe remains and indeed is exacerbated by the Crimean War. The Russians may have been defeated in Crimea, but their incursions into the Balkans opened a Pandora's box of nationalist movements across the Ottomans' European territories. With Russia's encouragement, Christian-led rebellions erupted throughout the Balkans. Ottoman reprisals were savage, stoking the flames of religious division. One of the most infamous examples occurred here in the small Bulgarian town of Batak in the spring of 1876. Joining the wave of uprisings spreading across Bulgaria, the townsfolk of Batak overthrew their Ottoman overlords. But their success was short-lived. Ottoman retaliation was so brutal, the memory of it continues to haunt the collective consciousness of Bulgarians to this day. The Ottoman retribution when it came was terrible. At the time, the regular army was in Serbia, putting down an uprising there. So they sent in the Bashi Bazooks, the crazies, to quell the rebellion here in Batak. Now, many were local men, so there's an element of old scores being settled, which made things particularly nasty. Christian versus Muslim. The massacre was frightful. Thousands dead, women and children, babes in arms. The bodies piled up. What became known as the Batak Massacre culminated in the Sveda Nadelia church here in the center of town where hundreds of villagers fleeing attack took refuge. In an effort to flush them out, the Bashi Bazooks laid siege to the church, setting it alight. By the time the ordeal had ended, thousands of villagers had died. Today, the church stands as a memorial to the tragedy, and the skulls of the many victims are kept on display as a sobering reminder of the atrocities that took place here. Stories of the massacre were widely reported in the Western press, causing a huge upswell in public disgust at what the Turks had done. Disraeli was dismayed, Gladstone wrote a pamphlet, Charles Darwin, Oscar Wilde, Victor Hugo were the outraged celebrities of their day. But nowhere was the trauma more deeply felt than in Bulgaria, and especially here in Batak, where the shockwaves of those ancient killings still reverberate. The Batak massacre has become a national tragedy in the story of Bulgarian independence. To learn more, I'm meeting Stefka Dimitrova, former director of the Batak Museum of History. Продължение на три денонощия, те били без хляб, без вода, без уражие. Но за да пренудят тези, които са вътре да се предадат, 
Те докарали коли с слама, кошери с пшели, запалили сламата, започнали да хвърлят вътре, да хвърлят и пчелите. И вътре настанал истински ад. Тогава една част от тях излезли отвън да си вземат въздух и били пленени от войска. Предложението им било такова. Или да станат мисиумани, като сложат фесовете на главата, или ще бъдат заклани. Нито един батачинен, нито един мъж, жена или дете не се е съгласил да промени своята вяра да стане месулманин. Всички от тях доброволно са отишли на дравника и са предложили да бъдат по-добре да бъдат заклани, отколкото да приемат чужда вяра. Целият бътак бил усеян с телата на млади момичета в бели ризи на деца, на мъже, на жени. Very major and terrible events, the beginning of Bulgarian nationhood. How do the people of Batak feel about the massacre today? Те учат своите внуци и правнуци и разказват за тяхния героизъм и за отдадения живот за свободата. Без Батак нямаше да има свободна България. The massacres were appalling, but they did ensure that the Bulgarian question was placed firmly on the agenda of the European powers. There was a, a growing feeling that this should never happen again and that the creation of a Bulgarian state perhaps was an obligation to those who died so terribly in, in, in the massacres. Western Europe may have sympathized with the plight of the Balkan Christians, but it was Russia who took decisive action. The following year, Russian troops crossed the Danube once again and with the aid of local rebel militias, attacked Ottoman forces. What became known as the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 only lasted a year, but it completely redrew the map of southeastern Europe and greatly diminished the Ottoman presence in the region. Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia and Montenegro would all gain independence. Russia took control of key Ottoman territories in the Caucasus and the Austro-Hungarian Empire occupied and eventually annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Balkan nationalist movement seemed unstoppable, but their success had profoundly altered the balance of power in the region. Fears of Austro-Hungarian dominance fueled a rise in secretive and extreme nationalist groups like the Black Hand Society in Serbia. The defining moment came in the summer of 1914, when Black Hand member Gavrilo Princip assassinated the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Archduke Ferdinand and his wife, while they were on a state visit to Sarajevo. What began as an extreme act of Serbian nationalism quickly spiralled out of control. Austro-Hungary, followed by Germany, declared war on Serbia. In retaliation, Russia declared war on Germany and Austro-Hungary. France, Great Britain and Belgium joined Russia, while the Ottoman Empire sided with Germany and Austro-Hungary. In little more than a month, World War I had begun. As battles raged across Western Europe, one of the bloodiest theatres of the conflict took place far away, in the Ottoman heartland of the Gallipoli Peninsula very spot where Ottoman warriors first crossed into Europe some 600 years before. In an effort to break through the Dardanelles Straits and occupy Istanbul itself, 
French, British, Australian and New Zealand forces engaged the Ottomans in a grueling eight-month-long struggle. When it was over, the Ottoman army could claim victory at Gallipoli, but at a price. The Gallipoli campaign was the final act in the Ottoman Empire's long history of military engagement on European soil. The Turkish War Memorial, here at Gallipoli, at the entrance to the Dardanelles Straits, stands as a powerful reminder of the devastation that the war brought to all those who took part in it. Kenan Celik is a local guide and a veteran of the Turkish army. His relatives fought and died at Gallipoli. The Battle of Gallipoli, a moment of nationhood for modern Turkey. But the soldiers who were fighting here, they were fighting for their homeland, an Ottoman Empire. Um, it was a matter of survival, was it not? Of course, it was a matter of survival. As you know, Navy attacked the force through Dardanelles. It was Church's idea. It would be easy to get through and occupy Istanbul, and then city would be sandwiched. Meanwhile, Russians were supposed to come from north and invade Istanbul. And then uh, Turkish existence in Europe would be uh, exterminated and Turks would have no lands in Europe at all. This was the idea in 1915. So then what about Turkish people? Where do they go? Where do they have a nation? Right, I mean, they, they were, this was the heartlands, uh, yeah. as well as the homelands. Mm. It was the heartlands of, yeah. the, of the Turkish Empire by this time. Mm -hmm. There was nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. We rather die here in the battlefield rather than see this. So it was homeland, of course. For the Allies, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, we remember this battle for the huge loss of life. But equally on the Turkish side, there was also many, many casualties. Mm -hmm. 57th Regiment, for example, joined the fighting. Turkish regiments at that time had uh, nearly 3,000 men, and only dozens survived from this regiment. The distance between trenches is eight yards, that wow. is certain. Eight yards? Eight yards. Goodness. And men in the first row die, yeah. and then men behind in the second row, no, they will replace them in a few minutes and they will die. And knowing this, without any hesitation, without any orders, they move and they replace first line which was wiped out already. It was the spirit of Turkish army which saved the country, motherland for us. And that was very important, significant thing. Well, they built a fantastic memorial to all these dead. A lot of Turks visit this memorial and try to find their relatives. My family lost two members. Really? My great uncle died here. My, ma my grandmother used to say uh, when he was called to join the army, he said before leaving home, if I go to Gallipoli, don't expect me anymore. A month later, army you know, sent a report to the village he was killed here. In war, everybody suffered. We know this, definitely. We welcome in people and we think uh, there's no point in uh, keeping hatred or animosity anymore. And we see this as a place of reconciliation. Gallipoli uh, should be a place of peace, uh, not uh, war any anymore. By the end of the Gallipoli campaign, there were 100,000 dead. For the Allies, it was a military disaster. For the Ottoman Empire, which was pretty much on its knees by this time, it was a last glorious victory, a shout of defiance. For the modern Republic of Turkey, Gallipoli is remembered as a moment of nationhood, a defense of the motherland when all else was lost. Gallipoli can be all these things. When it comes to Gallipoli, the Turks are fighting for their own independence, in a sense, in the same way that the Bulgarians the Serbs, the Montenegrins, the Greeks had. And they're, they're in a sense, the, the last uh, country in the Ottoman Empire to declare independence. The Ottoman Turks may have won the battle for Gallipoli, but they were on the losing side of the war. And in the aftermath, they found themselves fighting for their very existence as the map of Europe and the Middle East was redrawn. The Allied powers occupied Istanbul and carved up Ottoman lands in the Levant, Arabian Peninsula and Anatolia, 
reducing the empire to a small area within Anatolia. As for the Balkans, Serbia merged with Bosnia-Herzegovina, Slovenia and Croatia to form the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. In Central Europe, Hungary and Czechoslovakia became independent states. Under the leadership of Army Commander Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, Turkish forces launched a war of liberation, regaining Anatolia and territory in southeastern Europe corresponding to modern-day Turkey. By November 1922, Ataturk had dissolved the Ottoman Empire. The last Sultan, Mehmed VI, was exiled and the Turkish Republic was born. Built on principles of democracy and secularism, it aimed in many respects to become the model of a modern European nation. After nearly six centuries, the Ottoman Empire was no more. But its legacy endures to this day, not just in Turkey, but throughout its former lands. The Ottomans ruled huge swathes of both the East and the West, so we cannot escape their influence today. It is all around us. A lot of the national boundaries that were created were created in reaction to the Ottoman Empire. It's a legacy that can be seen in a very positive light because it was an empire which lasted for centuries, that was multicultural, was successful. It proved that groups could live together, that is, religious groups, Muslims, Christians, Jews. They certainly did enable some form of cultural cohabitation, if not mutual tolerance. And the creation of national states created the atmosphere in which cultural aggression could more easily take place. A huge area has been affected by that long engagement with this superpower that perhaps stopped the development of these countries. And when that was withdrawn, things have degenerated, you might say, in all kinds of ways. I think there are less legacies from the history of Ottoman incursions into Europe than there are legacies of European incursions into the Ottoman Empire. And if we've learned anything from the history of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, it is that you intervene in the Islamic world at your peril. Gallipoli and the narrow stretch of water separating Asia from continental Europe. This is where the Ottomans first crossed over into Europe and where they fought their last great battle against a European army. Five and a half centuries separate these two events which bookend the Ottoman engagement with Europe. This is a period of history which is often portrayed as a clash of civilizations. But the reality is much more complex than that, more a meeting of civilizations, a cross-cultural exchange of people, commodities, ideas, even religious precepts. One can no more take the Ottomans out of Europe than Europe out of the Ottomans. Theirs was a shared destiny.